A cheap imported vacuum sealer from AliExpress, also available from eBay, all the usual suspects. And it, this one came with 10 of these bags, a fairly decent size. Uh, let me just give you the size of the bags it came with, but you can get more bags as well. Uh, so this one is about, say, 6 inches, 150 millimeter by uh, usable area inside about 200 millimeters or 8 inches tops. So let's stuff this in, noting that the smooth side has to go down. Uh, is it the smooth side goes down for this? One moment till I actually look at the instructions. Okay, smooth side up apparently. So these bags are specially designed for vacuum use and they've got this uh, texture in them that lets it pull the air out before it seals it. And this will be sealing it as well. So let's do what many of the eBay sellers are doing these days and sticking things like plush toys and beanies and stuff like that into uh, vacuum sealing packs because it lets them squish them down and save uh, cost in the postage. So you press the button aside Inside is this protective piece of paper and you don't throw that away. It's to protect the seals. When you've got it in the storage, you put this back in. It's really just to stop these seals sticking together. We'll take a look at those seals later on. There are the two seals, the vacuum bit, and there's also this rubbery seal at the top going on to the heat element here, which does the sealing. So let's put this in with the texture at the bottom, the smooth at the top, I think that's what it said. And there's a little hook bit you can put it in just to basically get a reference position in the vacuum chamber and then you swing this down it latches and then you press this button and it's now putting a vacuum you can help it on its way by squishing the item if you wish to give it an extra super vacuum and get things ultra flat so it's showing about five watts and oddly very oddly the meter i'm testing this with doesn't seem to see the ceiling cycle, which it goes up to 60 watts. This little me meter here did not see the ceiling at all. I wonder if it's a uh, half wave or something like that, and it's just not seeing that polarity. But anyway, now that's been done, there's a little release thing here if needed. You press the catches at the side, pop it out, and it's actually put a heat seal across it, and your thing will be extra flat and squishy for posting or for preserving. Um, I think you could probably use the bigger versions of this for 3D printer filament, but see how this is all squished flat. As soon as you let the air back in again, it uh, expands back up again. You can see it reconstituting back into the plushie. The other option it has, and they say you're supposed to leave a time before doing this, but, but then why bother? Uh, you can just put it in like this close it down and for this because it's not pulling the vacuum they recommend push it in the middle you can just push uh, this little button here until the blue light goes out the red one lights and then it will go through a ceiling cycle just without actually pulling a vacuum and when the red light goes back out and the blue light comes back on that means it's finished and it should be sealed i'm waiting for it is it yeah there it goes uh, give it a second to cool and then push the catch buttons at the side lift up and it has done the heat sealing thing on the bag right excellent i should put that to the side let's unplug this and explore it it does say you should leave it a few minutes between operations or, or a certain a cooling time between operations i wonder if that's down to economy on power components i guess they're just allowing for the time it takes to stuff things into the bag so what we have in here, we have the upper vacuum seal, which is this foam strip here. And we have the lower vacuum seal, which is looks like an identical foam, foam, foam strip. Let's just pop those out then. You can put them in again afterwards. And we've also got the silicone heat sealing strip here, which is quite hot. It's been seeing that heat and it's got a profile like basically the seals that you just push into a metal frame or plastic frame in this case. Okie dokie. The latches at the side are very simple. They're just basically little spring-loaded plastic tangs that as you push them down, they click in. And then when you go to release it, all you're doing is uh, pushing the buttons at the side that push those tangs back in. And I think it relies on the vacuum. In the vacuum mode, it relies on the vacuum actually pulling it down, to act, pulling the lid down with that suction pressure to uh, provide a good seal. Now, do these pop off? Oh, these do pop off. You can pop the lid off. Didn't know that. No, now. Let's pop this open and see what's inside. 
345 grams, by the way, 12 ounces. It's quite a lightweight unit. So I shall pop some screws out of this. I've seen these online before, and they go at ridiculously low prices. This one was about £7 with some bags and shipped, but I've seen them cheaper. But the question is, can you go too cheap? Probably. You can probably go dangerously cheap when they've cut every corner. I'm pretty sure that this will be copper-coated aluminium cable like all the other ones. Because everything's copper-coated aluminium these days. There's also a little vent here. Oh, that'll be the air vent for the uh, vacuum pump, presumably. We'll soon find out when we open it. And the last screw. What's it going to reveal? A little switch mode power supply, perhaps? The heating wire might be directly means powered. There is a stand oh, There's very little inside it. There's one of the heat element connections. There's the other. Oh, it smells quite hot. There's the little vacuum pump motor. They've literally just shoved that into the moulding like that. That's quite neat. Excellent. But here's the bit we're interested in. It's very small. I mean, you'd expect that. It is, shall we say, cost optimised. I see the mains going straight into it there. It is unplugged, of course. I feel the need to say that these days. What am I seeing? I'm seeing a switch mode power supply. I'm seeing what could be a triac switching direct to the mains for this. Well, you know what we do now? Uh, let's check it's discharged by sticking my fingers across the fattest capacitors. Yes, it's discharged. Um, we'll t unplug the pump and we'll unplug the heating element and uh, we'll reverse engineer the circuit board and see what's in it. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And that was not an easy schematic to reverse engineer because uh, there are lots of missing components in this that allude to perhaps using a different variant of this power supply chip. But that's mainly the power supply. Once we get to the main circuitry, it's all fairly standard. So the first thing to note that is quite important is that this down here is a triac and it's switching the heating element. The heating element has a resistance of about 140 ohms, which means on 240 volt supply, it could potentially uh, dissipate 400 watts. And that means if this track fails or the circuitry glitches and crashes out, then the unit could basically go on at 400 watt heating element just continually with no thermal cutout. Just be aware of this. I do recommend that you do not leave this plugged in. It's the usual thing that they just basically, they don't think of the things that can go wrong. It also means, well, let's uh, calculate that. It's 140 ohms, so uh, 120 volts divided by uh, I equals V over R, 140 ohms would theoretically give 0.8 times 120 equals about 102 watts. Okay, that's interesting. So it could be a universal voltage unit. And there's only one way I can think it can achieve that, particularly given it is switching the heating element via this uh, triac. But anyway, let's, I digress. Here is a power supply section. I'll show you in the schematic. One of the most annoying things about it is the fact there is a snubber network for protecting the transistor in the chip, but it's not occupied. But worse than that, they've just not bothered connecting these tracks that should have been common together to make the snubber network. Um, it's very odd because it's referenced to, like the zero volts is referenced to one leg of the mains. Even the feedback circuit on an isolated supply actually is reference to the mains. The whole lot's reference to the mains. Um, we have the chip, we have the output, we have a MOSFET for controlling the motor with a protection diode. Uh, that diode is part of the power supply circuitry. Um, what else is there to say? I think really, well there's a Zener diode down here and a current limiting resistor for the 5 volt supply and a missing voltage regulator but with a little zero ohm link across that because they decided it was stable enough just with a Zener diode dropping it. I shall explain that in the actual schematics. Let me grab those now. So the schematic is a two-pager. This is the main supply coming in here. It does two things. It goes to the power supply and also provides a reference to the microcontroller for the zero crossing point detection, but it also powers the heater via this track. So keep in mind that this 
side of the power supply, the mains, has the heater, which is based on a fiberglass cord with fine wire wrap around it. And then it's covered across with that uh, polytetrafluorethylene PTFE tape. I'm trying to think what the name is. Teflon tape. That's the word I'm looking for. That's the only thing that's insulating that. It's just that layer of Teflon tape between that heating wire. So keep in mind this triax here, and it's controlled from the microcontroller, which is on the next page of the schematic. So for power supply, we've got a single diode feeding a capacitor. There's no bridge direct fire. The reason for that is that this leg of the mains is the common zero volt rail for the power supply. And the reason for that is because the triax reference to it and it needs to get a mains referenced um, signal to actually turn it on to its gate pin. This chip here is, let me just remind myself the number. It says 3773CH. It doesn't say who it's by, but Freeman Micro Devices do make one like that. However, I didn't find a schematic. I didn't find a data sheet at all. I didn't find a schematic that tallied up with the way they've got it configured with just effectively four connections. Very strange. Uh, but here is the primary of the transformer that is uh, I giving, I was going to say an isolated supply. Giving the low voltage supply, it's not isolated. It also connects to the mains. But this transformer here is pulsed by this uh, chip here. And uh, it must do so, unless it's got internal current sensing, which is a possibility, um, it will just do it on a fixed time. It derives its own power supply, possibly internally, from the this pin up here. Very strange. Not a standard configuration. And it's got the feedback pin, which is connected directly across the secondary and uh, divides it down. I estimate that it, the feedback is circa roughly 1.2 volts to give what it does, which at the final uh, output is 10.8 volts. Um, that goes via a Schottky diode and it charges this capacitor, 470 microfarad, 16 volts. And then there's a current limiting resistor and a W8 uh, Zener diode, 5.1 volts, and a capacitor to provide a 5 volt supply for the microcontroller. So now we've got four circuit connections going across to the rest of the circuitry. We've got the 0 volts, the 5 volts, the 10.8 volts, which is for the vacuum motor, and the zero crossing point detection, which is connected to the mains and has a very high value 2 mega ohm resistor, basically connecting directly to the microcontroller input. A fairly standard approach. Next page is simpler. Is it simpler? It's relatively simple. Here is the microcontroller. I don't know what microcontroller it is, but it just so happens that pins 1 and 8 are 5 volts and 0 volts respectively, and also pin 4, which would normally be the master clear, and also the programming voltage pin, is the only one that actually has a pull-up resistor for the switch, which is a common thing to do with a PIC-12 microcontroller because that pin can't have an internal pull-up owing to the fact it is the programming voltage pin. So this uh, gets its 5 volt supply and it controls the vacuum pump motor via this line going via to this MOSFET. It's an A2SHB classic MOSFET with a 100k pull-down resistor just to make sure it behaves itself and it's not getting a control signal. When the MOSFET turns on, it runs the pump. The pump is a back EMF spike diode here, but it's also got a capacitor for filtering, which is good. This resistor between the T10.8 volt and the 0 volt is simply because I forgot it off the previous part, the schematic. It's basically a low load just to make sure that the power supply can actually provide itself power just by keeping the 10.8 volts topped up every so often by putting a slight drain in it. The triac, when it's finished pumping it down and it runs the heater, the triac has been driven via this 100, 510 ohm resistor to the uh, gate of that triac, which is, of course, referenced to zero volts, which makes it easy to drive. The two buttons, this one with the pull-up resistor and this one, which doesn't just act as a button, but when it's not being used as a button, when it's active, it also can be used to drive these two LEDs, the red and the blue, via what common 100 ohm resistor by swapping the polarity between these two pins. The zero crossing point detection is most likely, it could be for multiple purposes. They could measure the time it goes between the zero crossing point. Because basically speaking, if you've got the main zero, mains waveform, as it 
crosses that zero point, you'll get it above that, it'll be like a solid high, and then it'll be a low uh, there on the other half. So it looks for that transition, and it can determine that's the point the main supply changed uh, polarity. And that could be used for two things. It could be used to determine, is it a 50 or 60 hertz unit? Because it might use that, because there's no other obvious way it can do that. Uh, it might use that to determine if it's 60 hertz, I have to put out the equivalent, I, I'm probably running on 120 volts. But if it's 50 hertz, I'm probably running on European voltage, 230 volts, 220, 240, whatever. So it might be doing that, but then it's also using it, presumably, I don't think it's doing phase angle control, but neither of my parameters was very happy reading this. Uh, but I think it's actually burst firing the triac. What that means is that, say for instance, you've got the uh, the sine wave, it might just burst fire it for one cycle, or it might burst fire it for several cycles, and then it will actually just turn it off. So basically speaking, it's just chopping it on and off, but it's switching at the zero crossing point just to avoid sort of electrical interference. But it's firing the heater in bursts. I would guess it's doing that because phase angle control would be more complicated. The inertia of a heater, the thermal inertia means that just driving it in burst firing mode, just turning it on and off in cycles, just keeps things much simpler and avoids causing interference. But that's more or less it. The thing is back together, and it still works. That's nice. Um, let me just bring it back in. It's got the cable wrapped around it in a menacing manner. But that's more or less it. Uh, it's an interesting device. Uh, it's really cost optimized. And let me show you again that uh, heating element in there that is mains referenced, but just covered with a bit of uh, the... PTFE tape, the, I see I've forgotten the name of it again, Teflon tape. It's not necessary. Teflon is a brand name for polytetrafluorethylene. But it's got this uh, heat resistant tape and uh, that's just the only thing between here and the sort of actual windings, which are referenced to the mains in one leg at all times. Just worth mentioning. And also, if things do go wrong and uh, the processor crashes and it turns this heater on all the time, it'll be the equivalent of a 400 watt heater uh, in a little plastic case just sitting there on your bench. So, as I said earlier, make sure you unplug it or turn it off when it's not in use. It's not enough to just say, oh, well, it's not on because although the blue LED is on, it's still plugged in. It's fine. It's not running. Just make sure you unplug it because things can go wrong. But there we have it. The vacuum sealer. It contained lots of surprises. It was quite a complex but clever little circuit. And it shows signs of ongoing cost optimization, which is why they can sell these things for roughly £5, which is ridiculous. It's amazing.